But I'm at sermons going to be in First Peter chapter five verse ten. But the God of all grace, who has but ca- has called us into His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, for thee He hath suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Now I'll have a prayer before Bramat comes up. Dear Heavenly Father. I pray that we'll have a good day. I pray that you'll give our Matt the strength to do his sermon. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I chose this text because it, it seemed to me to be a fitting summary of salvation as it concerns humanity. I, I really, rather than to do a specific thing, I wanted to do more of an overview. Above and beyond all else, really, you were created, you were called, and you were chosen to be a vessel of glory. That God would use you to fulfill the good purpose of his will. And yet, there is a work in us that we experience as we willingly participate in this process. Uh, in the end, we will, all, we will all be able to see salvation is of the Lord. But in the present, there is a, a working out of that that has to happen. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. In this first half of the verse, he says that he is the God of all grace. Now, grace is like a divine resource. It's a resource which, when it's given, it makes the recipient able to perform the work that God has desired would be done. Grace is like the divine enabler. It's, it's, it's what, what makes you able to do what God wants. In our text, Peter makes this statement that God is a God of grace. He is one who enables men to do what he requires of him. And this aspect of God, um, in my mind, it really highlights the goodness of God. He really has not required of us the impossible. He hasn't set the bar this high and, and, and said, well, good luck. You know, he's, he, he's, made a, he's made a way for you to actually be able to do this. And, and, and the thing about it that's so glorious is that he gives you the power, he enables you to be able to do it, and then once you give that back to him, you actually get credit for it. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing, really. Not only this, but he is a God of all grace. Uh, there's, there's nothing that cannot be done with the empowerment of God. Now, all things that are needed to perform that which he desires are found in, in the provision that he has given us. There, there's no grace anywhere that can't be found in God. He's a God of all grace. Mm-hmm. So th- through this pr- provision that he's given us, namely in his son Christ Jesus, we are complete. We are actually fully able to do what he requires of us because of his empowerment through the Spirit. So this being said, just to put in context the rest of the verse, this is the God who's called us to his, who's, his eternal glory through Christ Jesus, Amen. the God of all grace. Yeah. Now this text can be seen in two ways. Firstly, that we've been called so that we would eternally be glorifying to our God. And secondly, and this is something that I've often considered, um, as you brethren well know, that we have been called to this willing, blessed participation and the exploits of the glory of God for all eternity. Yeah. Uh, doesn't that sound good? Amen. Amen. And really, these are two perspectives that, that they're kind of different in their focus, but they're one. See, God is actually going to be glorified eternally in what he has done in the saints to make them a willing, fully able uh, group of servants to do his good pleasure, but then in their actual working and participation and his purpose, there's a there's a um, something that we can have fellowship with in there. We know that when Jesus comes again to gather up the saints to present them unto himself, a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, it says that we'll be glorified together with him. Glorified together. That's that's a a weighty consideration. This involves our actual participation in this. We're, we're not just like trophies of grace. I mean, we are that, but it, uh, we are also partakers of this. We're heirs together with Christ. We are going to reign with Christ for eternity. And, and, and that's really the glory of it. The glory isn't of just something that God has done in this inanimate object. He's done it in a man, in a person, in someone who's actually able to willingly partake in this, in this purpose that he has purpose for, for the, the ages to come. Now, every time I try to express this thought, 
in a way that adequately per, per, portrays the, the greatness of it, the glory of it. I, I find, I re, am reminded that there really aren't any words that can encapsulate this. There, there, there's not, you can't really fully express in language the joy that's, that you're going to experience on that day. And I, I'm, I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul when he talks about the things that he saw when he was lifted up to the third heaven. You know, things that are unlawful. You, you can't even express this in language. You can't properly describe or convey it. Our, our inheritance that we have coming is like this. And as blessed and edifying and wonderful the promises that we have given and descriptions of these things, we admit that in, in, in the present time, we just see this through a glass darkly. Uh, the, the half has never yet been told. But this is our hope. This is the joy that's set before us, so to speak. That this, being able to see this, that we will be glorified together with him, and actually makes it reasonable to lay your life down for him in the present. It makes you able to be able to count all but lost and count it all but dung that you may win Christ that we have awaiting us an eternity of being able to fulfill our desire to in all things please our God, our creator, our king, and our savior. Amen. Yeah. As well as, as, as be a participant in this, in this glory. Mm-hmm. So he, he, he goes on here to enumerate some of these, these, these aspects of, of what it means to be, to be conformed into the image of Christ. What, what we have to do to be able to be prepared for this day to be able to, to partake of this glory. And just so you know that the road to heaven isn't covered with flowers and soft grass to tread on, he tells you, after that you have suffered for a while, there is something, uh, there is a suffering that, that accompanies with Amen. this. Now, this is something that we read often throughout the epistles. Uh, the brother Peter here gives his, um, in our text, he talks about it, but uh, Paul also talks about this quite often too. He says in the third chapter of Philippians, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. There's like a, a, a fellowship with the, with the remnant of the, the sufferings of Christ that's been left behind. And in 2 Timothy, he says, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. This is how, how, how fully we are being called to fellowship with Christ in this. We actually fellowship with his sufferings as well. And then the 8th chapter of Romans, he said it this way, if, And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. If we want to obtain the prize to which we are running, there's, there's going to be some suffering that accompanies this journey. And I, I, don't, I don't think that this is being talked about enough. The, the way to heaven isn't just la-di-da. It's not covered with, you know, you're not floated on a cloud to heaven. It's, it's, and, and, and really, how, how, mu- how much heaven would heaven be if that was the way it was? That's right. the, 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 the things that are way, the... Re, the um, Wickedness of this present world and the suffering that we have to go through now, it's like it, it just enhances the, the, our desire for the things to come. There are certain things which only really come through spiritual conflict and adversity in the present that, that can only be accomplished in us experientially. It's, it, we're, we're tried by fire. This is something that we have to pass through. And however, that being said, we see the mercy of the Lord in this suffering and that although we must suffer, we're not suffering for suffering's sake. There is a purpose in it. Now, when I was younger, I used to ask uh, why I had to do this or do that around the house. My mom, my stepdad would tell me, well, it builds character. You know, and as, as much as I hated him to, to hear him say that at the time, that's it's kind of like a parallel to what I'm talking about here. Uh, uh, there's a certain spiritual work ethic, so to speak, that is developed in the working out of things that's required for the work that's going to be done uh, in, in the future. Through the crucible of conflict and of opposition, there is a certain spiritual quality that's gained that can't be gained any other way. But... That being said, take comfort in knowing this, that God has not made you to suffer for no reason. 
And suffering is not like the divine initiation right to enter into heaven. You know, so the fraternities and orders and stuff like this, they have like an initiation right. Where it's, it's really pointless. They really make you suffer for no reason. This is not what the suffering is like in the kingdom. It, it accomplishes something. It is purposeful for what the Father intends for you in the world to come. Now, I appreciate the wording of this very much, and it testifies to the mercy and the goodness of God that he tells you that you must suffer, but he puts this qualifier on it for a while. Yeah. Now, we do well to remember this in a time of trial that God has actually appointed these. God has appointed this for a time and that he has determined for them there to be an end to it. And... Uh, I, I appreciated Brother Aaron's sensitivity to this here lately, that as, as much as we would like for trials to come to an end, we also have to be sensitive to the working of God in the trial and to not seek for a premature end of a trial that God is using to add something to us. He knows what he's trying to teach us. He, he knows each and each and every trial what he has appointed it for. So, And we've prayed this often in the assembly. We, we, we will lift up our petition for him, but we'll tell the Lord, you know, we want your will to be done in this above and beyond anything else. So, so I pray the Lord would help us to be more sensitive in this, in this area. And the Lord is in control of each and every one of these, and, and he can help us to maintain this perspective that's in our text. That on the divine calendar, where a day is as a thousand years and a, as a thousand years is as one day, it's, it's just a while. Yeah. Now, this perspective of our suffering in the present is one that um, our brother Paul was very familiar with. He said in he, the 10th chapter of Hebrews, for, for yet a little while, and he that shall, shall come will come and will not tarry. In the second chapter of Corinthians, he said it this way, and I, this is one of my uh, favorite ways that he said this. I've, I've quoted this quite often, but it's, it's, it's a good one. For our light affliction, which is it's for a moment, it, it worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And we're talking about the suffering on this end and a weight on the other end. That's, that's a good way to see it. And, and that can lead you to the conclusion to say this, to, to be able to reckon that the sufferings of the present, they're not even worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. So you have to be able to see this perspective of things. If, if, if you're going to make it from here to there, you, have, you can't lose hope in every trial as if this is the, the way always things will always be this way. You know? This world must be seen within the context of eternity. It's, it's only then that you'll be able to bear up under the trial and, and, and be able to actually be thankful that you were counted worthy to, to suffer Amen. for Christ's sake. Now, after having established the need for this suffering, he lays out the things that these sufferings are designed to create in you. This is something that's a, a work that's being done in you. What the new creation does in a person who's dwelling in Christ by the grace of God. Now, before I go into the particulars of this, I was reminded, it occurred to me that if you go down the list, this is like a stark contrast to the nature of Adam. Men in the flesh are not perfect. They're, they're imperfect. Men in the flesh are not established. They're, un, they're unstable. They're weak, and, and they're troubled. So having been made partakers of the divine nature in Christ, we're actually currently being made more fully suited to employ the various characteristics resident within the divine nature. Uh, we must be acclimated in the present to live appropriately in a body that matches the spirit which we've been made partakers of. It, 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 we have to be prepared for a body that will be compatible to the spirit that we've been given. This is something, we actually have to be acclimated to where we can, we can full, whenever that day comes and, and when we are given that new body, we'll fully be able to, to use it for, for what it's intended. Yeah. So first, firstly, he tells you, make you perfect. Now, perfection as it's used here doesn't really primarily mean a state that cannot be improved upon. Although it's, it's part of it. In this sense, it means to be fully suitable for a particular function, to be perfect. He, he's, he's making fully fit what he desires for us in the ages to come, to, to be perfectly suited for his purposes. I, I'm not often edified by reading the dictionary, but I was when I when I read this uh, the um, definition for it they had. They said conforming absolutely to the description or definition of an ideal type, or exactly fitting the need in a certain situation or for a certain purpose. That's we are being made perfect for what what his intention is. 
Uh, in our case, there's a sense in which we have been made perfect, in which we are being made perfect, in which we will be made perfect. Our, our texts speak more of the latter, too. But it's, it's not that there are glaring stains of iniquity that have yet to be removed for, from us. Uh, we are b- being constantly more fully conformed to the image of Christ, but we are perfect from the standpoint of reconciliation. Uh, but, you know, we are, we are perfect in that sense. But there remains a work of sanctifying that must be perfected. There is a certain amount of work that must be done on us to be able to fit into the role in which we will fill in the ages to come. And again, as the suffering causes us to be conformed, this is one of the aspects of this confirmation and being being perfected. We as living stones, we're actually being molded and shaped into the place in which we'll fit in this, in this new Jerusalem, into the habitation of God and the Spirit. So ultimately, this desire of Peter expressed in our text for the believers to be perfected as the Lord intends is not really exclusive to individuals. It's, it's being perfected within the context of the whole. I was, I was, the reason why I thought about that is because I was reminded of the 17th chapter of John and this, this prayer that Jesus prayed. And w- when he said this, And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they be, may be made perfect in one. So this is, this is something that we do well to be mindful of in our relation to the brethren, to, that we are not made perfect without one another. This is, uh, this is an entire work that he is doing. Everyone has their own race to run. Everyone has to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. But primarily, salvation is a collective thing. He is, he is, he is saving a, a body of people. And so um, we ought to be mindful of this, to labor to aid the brethren in their own running within the context of the entire body and mind. Like I had said, we we all have our own race to run, but there's a sense in which we're all one large racing team. To to not run, we need to labor to not run our own race lazily as to distract and possibly cause some of the brethren to follow our example and maybe slow down their pace. But at the same time, we want to be not negligent to pick up that brother who has tripped or, or to, to offer a glass of cool water to the brother who's weary from running. Amen. Ultimately, this will find its culmination and its aggregate as, as the, the body yeah. as of Christ in the end. So then he goes on to say that he will establish you. Now we see again the contrast here from the Adamic nature and the new creation. Men in general, they're not really established. We can see this in the nations and the things that are going on in the world. They're tossed to and fro by situational factors. There's, there's no spiritual consistency. There's f- fighting and indwelling. There's all, all kinds of things. It's just, uh, uns- I, I appreciate the way that Jacob said, unstable as water when he was talking about Reuben. There is no spiritual consistency. Their joy and their general sense of well-being is determined solely by where they are in time and circumstance. And they are mostly unable to see beyond what's happening to them in the present. I know this is kind of a poor example, but I, I was thinking about it. Have you ever been to a restaurant and you've been with people who have had to wait about five minutes later than what the server had told them they were going to have to wait? They're up there screaming, at it, we've been waiting for 45 minutes and I can't believe it. Uh, to be established is to be brought to a state where you're not moved or turned aside by, by circumstance, by things that they can't see beyond right here and now. Like, I'm never going to get out of this waiting room. But they can't look forward to the fact that, well, one of the, eventually I'm going to be in there eating, you know. To be, yeah, to be established is to be brought to a state where you're not turned aside by adversity. You're not thrown on the rocks of doubt and despair over every little bit of opposition that meets you. To be firm and unmovable in your conviction and your zeal. To be consistent and unwavering. To be patient and to be content with what you have been given. Knowing that there is an end to all of this. That the found. The foundation of, to all of those who are truly established, rooted and grounded in the faith is that God is in control of all things, that he knows what is best for you. Now, um, I wanted to move on here when he says that he will strengthen you. Now, the first thing I thought of when I began to think of this aspect of what we're being made in Christ, I was reminded that when we were without strength, 
in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So this, this is like the commentary of the Spirit concerning men in the flesh, without strength. And this is not something that men are really known for, is, is strength of will, you know. The ability to do and to, to accomplish with fortitude and power, bring forth what you desire to be done. Uh, we see this going all the way back to the fall, that Eve really did not have any strength of will in there in the garden. When confronted by the Spirit, she didn't have the strength of conviction to overcome temptation. She was innocent, but, but she wasn't strong. She was weak. She was vulnerable. However, this is not the state of those who are in Christ. This is what we are, we are bring, being brought to, to be strong. This is the intention of God and salvation, to make a strong race of men. Amen. Individuals who are able, who can carry out his purposes, who are not easily overcome, who don't quickly abandon the work when weariness sets in, who don't shrink back in the day of opposition. If those who put their hand to the... He, he's, he's looking for those who put the, will put their hand to the plow and don't look back. That's, that's what he is working in you. That, that's his intention. Those who will press towards the mark who will press past that opposition but but in, in all of this they will testify the lord is my strength that's the reason why they were able to do that but again as these other aspects of character resident within the divine nature that we've spoken of earlier this is a strength that must be developed within us we have not been given we've been given a parallel even in earthly things you weight bodybuilders weightlifters what do they have to do they have to lift and lift weights and it, it kind of tears their muscles and then they heal as they do that they build muscle mass they become more and more strong and I, I think I made this mistake in the past I haven't actually come out and said this but it's like I've convinced myself in my spirit there's a there's a list of set limitations of what I, I I'm not able to do or what I'm not able to bear yet in, in the kingdom really as you extend yourself to take on something that's greater than what you had previously had been able to do that's when you get the increase Amen. And if you're in the faith for too long, I think you'll find that the Lord will do this. He'll, he'll, if you have been living up to what you've been given, he'll actually give you a trial that's greater than what you can bear. And in the trial is when you will, you will actually have more strength to be able to do that. So really, if things proceed according to design, you actually ought to be able to bear more than you did in times past. You ought to be more able to deal with adversity. Now, I was reminded of, in Psalm uh, 84, he talked about those in, in Zion going from strength to strength, or the, the words in, in, of the hymn writer where he said, and strength to strength oppose. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, like going from glory to glory, yeah. going from, from one stage of strength to another, increasing as, as you go along. And the outcome of these things is that in the end, you will be found strong in that day to be able to stand before your God and give an account of the deeds done in the body. And lastly here, he says that he will settle you. Now this is, um, men are often overcome with worry. This is what, you know, men in general are known for this. They worry because they're uncertain about uh, what, to, what to do with what's happened to them. They don't know how to deal with their, with their circumstance. They're worried because there's things over which they have no control. And they worry about things that might happen. They said, sit around and worry, well, 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 this could happen because they, they really don't know it could happen in any given circumstance. However, God doesn't really worry in this sense. God does not fret over anything. He, he's in complete control. He, he's not surprised. He's not like caught off guard. He's, he's never found in a quandary where he, he doesn't know what to do. And he's not perplexed. He's settled. And so this is the state to which we're being brought in Christ Jesus, that, that we would be able to wholly and completely let the peace of God rule in our hearts and our minds. There's a certain amount of stability in heart and mind that, that would be found to where we, we, we would never find ourselves overcome with undue care. You know, it's, it's, it's right to have a certain amount of concern, but when you, there's difference between that and worry and care. Well, this is similar to being established and that you're, you're not tossed to and fro by the whims of circumstance, but it has more to do with peace and tranquility in the spirit. A, a certain spiritual calmness, like a, a quietness of spirit. This is the, the product of the full assurance of faith. Again, I was reminded of the hymn writer's word, blessed quietness. 
holy quietness, what assurance in my soul. That's, that's, that's the testimony of a person who is settled. Yeah. To not allow anything to overwhelm your spirit. To, to walk in the spirit and not walk according to the roller coaster of human emotion. Now, in all of these things, brethren, in, in conclusion to this, today is, as we continue to think and to medita meditate on the things of the Lord, I, I exhort you to take courage in knowing that the God of all grace is the one who has determined these things. That not one single aspect of this work depends solely upon your own determination and power to bring them to pass. You are undergirded by a God who is able and the God who is perfect in righteousness, he is holy, 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 who cannot lie, who has given us great and precious promises, who is stable, unmovable, who is strong in power and might, and sure and steadfast, who is settled and at peace with all of his works, who is in no wise confounded or frustrated to bring to pass all that he has determined. And what's more, he has determined in Christ Jesus to conform you to be perfectly suited for your involvement in the divine purpose in the ages to come. I, I pray, brethren, that the Lord will strengthen your hope in these things as you, you ponder them in your heart today.